Mengele was known as the Angel of Death. He wanted to improve the stock of the Aryan race. The idea was that I should go now and try to find Mengele. He was living in fear of being arrested. There are sightings everywhere of Mengele. They refused to give anything up. They said, no, it's not Mengele, it's not true. They lied, they denied it. There were many who believed that he could have staged a death. And there still are people who think that he's alive. Buenos Aires, 1958. The Argentinian capital's old world charm and famed nightlife have made it a magnet for European expatriates. It is also a magnet for Nazi war criminals, fugitives like Dr. Joseph Mengele, the angel of death. He liked Buenos Aires, and there was a large German community, some of whom were Nazis. He had a bit of cash. He was a man about town, and certainly he was very well connected. He met Hans Rudel, Hitler's most decorated pilot. He met Wilhelm Sassens, who was a wanted war criminal uh, from Belgium. He was still very much a passionate Nazi. This was not a life on the run that was terrible. It was quite luxurious. And in 1958, the man that we think of as the angel of death, the most hunted man of the world, was in the telephone book in Argentina. One of the things that happens that changes everything for Mengele is that in 1959, he's indicted by the West German government. The Auschwitz-Birkenau doctor is wanted for mass murder and also for performing unspeakably cruel medical experiments on children as young as five. Germany demands Argentina hand him over to face justice. And that scared him and made him feel unsafe in Buenos Aires. And that was good, because he, he deserved to live in fear. What Megala doesn't know is that there is more to fear than just an extradition order. Israeli agents are on the hunt for Nazis in Argentina, and they've already caught one. He took off his clothes to, to make sure that he doesn't got any weapon or razor blade to, to kill himself. I told him who we are and what we demand from him. Adolf Eichmann, the architect of Hitler's final solution, is in Israeli hands. After they kidnapped Eichmann, Zvi Aharoni interrogated him and said, where's Mengele, where's Mengele? And he refused to answer about any question about us. And Eichmann was absolutely you know, loyal and, and, and said, I have no idea where he is. In fact, the two had shared cake and coffee several times in Buenos Aires. Eichmann and Mengele actually meet each other at the ABC cafe, and uh, they don't get on very well. He viewed Eichmann as a lower class officer who lived in this terrible area of Argentina, in the suburb of Buenos Aires. Mengele was more regal. He associated with intellectuals. He had the top end of the Reich. Eichmann was on the, he was a working class stiff at the Mercedes factory. The Mossad interrogators apply more pressure. Finally, Eichmann cracks. He knew that uh, Mengele was somewhere in the Argentine, maybe in Buenos Aires but he, he had no contact with Mengele. He met him before, but he had no idea of his address and where, what he's doing now. For the Mossad, Mengele is right up there with Eichmann on their most wanted list. Mengele had the worst name in Israel than Eichmann. He was a real butcher. Mengele's big interest was in genetics and he wanted to uh, look at how you could improve the stock of the Aryan race and therefore propagate a master race. The Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp was the site of Mengele's nightmarish medical lab. 
part of his experiments were about sterilization. So to find out how they could sterilize the, the Eastern races, the Slavs, the gypsies, those less, the inferior races at a faster rate. And he had power of life and death. Most of Mengele's human guinea pigs perished. Uh, the experiments get progressively worse, and by the time he leaves there, he is the monster that we've all come to know him for. Three days after the Eichmann abduction, Agent Aitan meets with Isser Harel. The Mossad chief has some good news. Israel found the address of Mengele in Buenos Aires. Issa Harrell was very keen to think, I can bring back two. I could get Mengele as well. The Mossad boss wants to mount a full-blown commando raid on the address. He wanted to do a second operation while the first one wasn't finished. And this is bad thinking. If you involve two things at the same time, you, um, you multiply the risk for failure. So I suggest not to do it. But Harrell doesn't want to miss what may be their only chance to capture the notorious doctor. He overrules his agents. Operation Mengele is on. The uh, Israelis actually went looking around Buenos Aires during that period in which they were holding Eichmann in the safe house. They stake out a boarding house where they suspect Mengele is living. That was really risky because we all traveled on false passports, on languages we didn't master. If you were caught in Argentina in 1960 as a known foreign spy, you wouldn't have been executed, but you would have been the guest of the Argentine government for a very, very long time. Mossad agents have tracked Nazi war criminal Joseph Mengele to what they hope is his hideout in Buenos Aires. He sent few people to check his apartment. And they were making pretty sort of blatant inquiries as to where he was. And they were going up to the boarding house where they thought he had lived and said, is this where Dr. Menele lives? Hoping that maybe they'd say, oh, don't you mean Mengele? Yes, he's, he lives over there. The risks were definitely the German community of Buenos Aires. There's a German community of a quarter million people then. It is the large German community that has drawn Nazis like Eichmann and Mengele to Argentina. The country's totalitarian regime, led by Juan Perón, has made them feel right at home. And everybody wonders, you know, why did South America, and Argentina in particular, become the place where the Nazis came to after the war? And the truth is that there were already links between the Nazis and Argentina during the war. During the war, Perón and the Argentine government had secret agreements with Himmler's uh, foreign espionage service. When the war ended, it was a natural extension of Argentina's role during the war to it, for it to receive Nazis afterwards. He was not in the house. The fact is that we couldn't find him. That, mu that means that he was dug in better than Eichmann. With no sign of the Nazi doctor, Harel decides to cut his losses and return to Israel with Eichmann alone. I'm afraid at that stage that the Mossad were, were on a very cold trail indeed. And uh, Mengele had long uh, flown the coop. Mengele moved, not because of the Israelis, but by sheer luck to Paraguay and wouldn't be in Buenos Aires. They would miss him. In December 1961, an Israeli court convicts Adolf Eichmann and hangs him for his crimes. But Mossad chief Isser Harel has not given up on Joseph Mengele. Harrell, though, was still determined that Mengele was someone they wanted to catch. He, he, he was a notorious figure. 
So Aharoni was ordered to mount an operation and to try and find him. Senior Mossad agent Zvi Aharoni returns to South America to track down the Nazi doctor. The idea was that I should go now and try to find Mengele. He goes undercover as a historian, writing a book about the SS. Zvi and his agents comb Argentina, Uruguay, Bolivia, and Chile. Some information pointed the way to Paraguay, but uh, when we were there, he had already left. The mission proves more challenging than even the Eichmann capture. It pushes the team to the limit. Finally, after two years of searching, they catch a break. They had picked up this Belgian war criminal. He was a former Dutch SS officer called the Lam Sassen. Sassen is a former drinking buddy of Mangala. And they said to him, we're going to take you back for war crimes unless you give us something better. He said, I'll give you Mengele. Sasson was very much plugged into the network, and, and he suggested that Mengele was in uh, Brazil. And so Aharoni and his team went there. He, he said he, he might have been hiding in a house near Sao Paulo. But identifying the fugitive Nazi won't be easy. He changed his name uh, more than once and had a relatively low profile. One of his distinguishing features was this gap between his teeth, and he was nervous about that, knowing that it was a, an identifying feature. He grew a big, bushy mustache that effectively covered the front teeth and made it difficult for anyone to see this gap. The team narrows their search to a ranch on the outskirts of the city. For the stakeout, Aharoni is joined by fellow agent Rafi Eitan, the man who led the Eichmann mission. Uh, we were looking for Mengele uh, in a farm about 50 kilometers from Sao Paulo. The Israeli spies spend days watching the ranch. The information provided by Sasson is beginning to look like another dead end. And then... I saw a man with a moustache and two people like bodyguards watching him. And one of them uh, for sure, was Mengele. Mengele was posted to Auschwitz in May of 1943. It was only a couple of months after he turned just 32 years old. We were loaded into cattle cars. People were praying, crying. He's standing at the ramps when the trains pull in. He wanted to be there to select the people to the right and to the left, those who would live and those who would die. The strongest would be chosen for slave labor. Young children, the old and the infirm, would be sent straight to the gas chambers. And everybody understood that there was no longer any escape. He was looking for his experiment victims. What Mengele wanted were twins. One of the best ways of establishing how, how genes work is to look at identical twins. One you do the experiments on, the other is the control you do nothing on, and you can see the changes and measure them one against the other. He'd inject different colored pigments into their eyes. 
he would use the twins to try to unlock this secret of what he viewed as the twin birth. And that involved in some cases the shooting of twins in the back of the head and then dissecting them as the corpses to see what was going on. It's not like, you know, he was just the sort of surgical murderer. He was also a brute as well. My mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand, hoping that as long as she could hold on to us, that she could protect us. I, in my childish curiosity, looked around, trying to figure out what on earth is that place, when I realized that my father and my two older sisters have disappeared in the crowd. A Nazi was running, yelling in German, twins, twins. We were wearing, as always, matching outfits. In this case, it was burgundy dresses. He demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother didn't know what to say. She asked if that was good. The Nazi nodded yes. And my mother said yes. I remember looking back and seeing her arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never got to say goodbye to her. The Israelis went out and they looked at that farm, they staked it out, and Zvi Aroni, the head of the Mossad team, told me these men walked past him and one of them he was convinced was Mengele. After 18 years on the run, it appears the angel of death is in the crosshairs of the Mossad. Mossad operatives believe they have sighted the world's most notorious Nazi fugitive. I'm sure that we did see actually Mengele. For now, the team's mission is limited to surveillance. They return to Israel to plan their next move. Agent Zvi Aharoni reports to Mossad chief Isser Harel. Harel didn't believe their intelligence. Aharoni said as a field agent that he felt as though the man he saw was Mengele, and that that was enough, therefore, to go. But what Harel was saying to him is, guess what? This is 1961. It's now 16 years after the end of the war. You're making a visual identification based upon somebody's SS photograph, which was taken in 1938. I need more evidence. Harel says the operation's canceled. We've got something else to do, and there were greater problems back at home. As Nasser, head of Egypt, had just fired rockets capable of hitting Israel, and German rocket scientists were down there working on them. And Isher Arel spent the next year on an assassination plot of killing off the rocket scientists. Operation Mengele is shelved. The Mossad's Nazi hunting unit is quietly disbanded. And, uh... Mengele lived. But the Nazi doctor is no longer enjoying the good life. After 1959, when he had to flee Argentina because of the extradition request, his life went into a very sharp decline. Mengele was growing increasingly paranoid that he was going to be caught. He's living a very nervous life. Joseph Mengele has no idea that the Mossad have given up their chase. He remains terrified that like Adolf Eichmann, he will be kidnapped and hanged for his crimes. He ended up on these little outback farms in the wilds of Brazil. He does build a watchtower in one of these farms he lives in, and he uses it to sort of survey, you know, the, the surrounding acres and kilometers around. That's his very commanding position. And he also had this whole pack of dogs with him. So he was a very, very paranoid, very edgy figure. Israel may have given up the hunt, but in West Germany, prosecutors continue to build a case against Mengele. There's a very loyal retainer of the Mengele a family called Sedelmeyer. Prosecutors suspect Hans Sedelmeyer has provided Mengele support since his flight from Europe. 
a judge who was then running the, the office that would investigate Mengele decided to go ahead and swear Hans Settlemeyer in under sworn oath and question him about whether he was supporting Mengele, the family was, money was going to him or anything else. Settlemeyer lied just through his teeth, said we've never seen him, don't know anything about him, probably dead, don't send him a penny. And they never went out to find out anything else. They accepted his word. Mengele's long flight is now nearly 20 years in the making. Auschwitz is liberated in, in January 45, but before that happens, Mengele has made good his escape. But he got away 10 days before the Red Army liberated the camp. It was complete and utter chaos. Tens of thousands of prisoners moving through the camps at the same time. Um, nobody quite sure of who was anybody. Uh, he fled with a suitcase full of his scientific findings. And he was picked up finally by the Americans in June of 1945. What saved him was that Mengele's vanity. When he had joined the SS, one of the things you had to do was have a blood type tattoo put under your arms. So that if they were wounded and unconscious, uh, they would know what kind of blood for transfusions. He was fastidious, uh, narcissistic, and he didn't want a tattoo, apparently. Mengele didn't want to mar his body. So he never had that distinguishing feature of an SAS man or officer, and that really helped him. So in the days at the end of the war, and they had a quite a simple litmus test. Take off your shirts, raise your hands. If they found a tattoo, they put you to one side and they would interrogate you. If there was no tattoo and you had some kind of reasonable story, then you were released, is what, which is what happened with him. Mengele drifted homeward through Germany. Mengele did not go back and live openly under his own name in his hometown. He lived under an assumed name on a farm uh, in Bavaria. Where he works for, you know, two to three years. American investigators show up at his wife's home and say, do you know what happened to your husband? And she says, I hear he's dead on the Eastern Front. And they close the file. But Mengele's family knows that he is alive and well. They even sent him money via Hans Settlemeyer. He came from a very rich family. The Mengele family were a family who produced farm machinery and in Germany. Well, the Mengele family ran the largest business in Gunzburg. Gunzburg was a company town. But as long as Dr. Mengele stays in Germany, he remains at risk. He was living in fear of being arrested. He saw what happened to you know the Nazis in the Nuremberg trials, where all the Nazi leaders were tried, convicted, and executed by hanging. He knew as a former Auschwitz doctor that, that this could very probably be his fate if he was caught. So he contacts his family back in Gunzburg, and, uh, and Sadelmeyer puts him in touch with various people who can help him. If you had enough money, you could flee. So he crossed into Austria. From Austria, he crossed into Italy. And like many other Nazis, he reaches Genoa. He got an Argentine um, landing permit in the name of Helmut Gregor. He boarded a ship called the North King to Buenos Aires. Mengele arrived in Argentina in August 1949. Before long, he begins selling farm machinery across South America. His business thrives. From 49 to 59, those 10 years he spent in Argentina were actually very good years. But after fellow SS officer Adolf Eichmann is kidnapped and indicted, Mengele's world begins to crumble. And let me tell you, there is nothing that scared the Nazi war criminals in South America more than that indictment. It ruined everybody's day, and it especially ruined Mengele's. He's just going from a succession of, of farms, being an itinerant farm manager, effectively, uh, in Paraguay, in Brazil. And uh, at one point, when he was on a farm in Brazil, um, there was a, a, a young calf, had a hernia. And uh, Mengele got out his surgical tools and performed this incredibly delicate and, and, and successful operation on removing this hernia. And the farm workers uh, realized that actually, you're not just some Swiss farm manager you claim to be. You know, you, you're something else. Though the Mossad has failed to capture him, Mengele's carefree life is gone for good. So Mengele 
grows increasingly isolated, depressed, and he ends up in a very modest bungalow on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. Ironically, as Mengele's fortunes dwindle, his legend grows increasingly outlandish. Throughout the late 60s and early 70s, the, the, the reputation of Mengele grows out of all proportion. It's partly fueled by Simon Wiesenthal, who has kind of made uh, Joseph Mengele his sort of poster boy. You know, this is the Nazi we all want to capture. This is the really bad one. This is, this is angel of death. Private individuals such as Simon Wiesenthal, you know, the Klarsfelds in, in Paris, they were the ones who were keeping the flame alive. We had known that uh, Mengele was uh, living in Paraguay, and uh, that's the reason I uh, demonstrated it in front of the Ministry of Justice in order to uh, get information about the fate of Mengele. Uh, the Klaasfelds did try to look for him, um, but probably a bit too late in the day. And a lot of people remained absolutely convinced that Mengele was in Paraguay all the way through the late 60s and 70s. And in fact, he, he had left Paraguay. Everyone had this notion of Mengele living in some jungle fortress with, you know, dogs yapping at his boots and cigarette boats out on the river and uh, minions following him around. You've got the Mengele of popular culture, boys from Brazil, the white suit, the all-powerful Nazi hiding in the jungle, the real stuff of myth. We thought Hollywood was doing documentaries instead of films. It turns out he lived a fairly squalid life. And uh, he's got this terrible nervous habit of chewing the ends of his moustache. And uh, he chews his moustache so much that um, he ends up with a hairball. His paranoid nature gets worse and worse. He's not a Nazi hiding in the jungle with a huge estate. He's a little old man with a hairball. Forty years have passed since the fall of the Third Reich. But Josef Mengele, doctor of the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp, remains at large. There are sightings everywhere of Mengele, saying that he was in southern Spain, he was an island in Greece, he was in a Paraguayan jungle with a great big factory, he was you know, everywhere but the moon, frankly. But uh, no one was really hunting for him. If there had been any serious effort, particularly by the German government, to find these criminals, it would have been extremely easy to find them and locate them and have them arrested. This was an, a Nazi war criminal living in South America, communicating regularly with his family and getting money from them. And all they had to do was look at the mail, and they never did it. I trusted the government of the world to do the right thing until I realized that they were covering up on right, left and on right. In 1985, on the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau, Eva Kor leads a small group of survivors to the concentration camp they were sent to as children. From Auschwitz, they travel to Jerusalem, where they hold a three-day mock trial of Dr. Mengele. 106 victims line up to testify against their Nazi tormentor. I would say that it's probably the, sh the closest thing to making feel a person like an animal, like a nothing, like a piece of garbage or a piece of meat. He would come every morning in immaculately dressed. I remember his black, gleaming boots. He had this white coat and he was handsome and he wore the uniform. He, he was this immensely um, uh, powerful figure. I was injected with something that made me very ill. He would uh, deliberately infect them to see how long the infection would take in one and not the other. I had extremely high fever. My arms, my legs were swollen to twice the size with huge red patches all over. Painful, very painful. Mengele's twisted desire to create an Aryan master race led to torturous experiments on more than 3,000 twins. 200 survived. 
So when Mengele came in with the four other doctors, and he looked at the fever chart, and he declared, laughing sarcastically, too schwer, too young, why walk to labor? Too bad. She's so young. She has only two weeks to live. That much I understood in German. Against the odds, Eva and her sister Miriam lived to see the Red Army's liberation of Auschwitz. The rest of their family perished. To me, it seemed like a nightmare that somehow if I could close my eyes and open them up again, the whole nightmare would disappear. But the nightmare did not disappear. In 1985, Campaigning by Eva Kor and others converges with political will. The pressure is building on the German government, on the Americans, on the Israelis because of this mock trial. There started to be multi-million dollar rewards offered for Mengele. Law enforcement officials from three nations meet to coordinate their efforts. The Germans um, were the hosts. There were several people from different agencies in, in Israel. And the US Marshal Service was there. Days later, the international team decides to act on a promising tip. After drinking heavily at a restaurant, Mengele's fixer, Hans Settelmeyer, let it slip to a friend that he's been supporting Mengele for years. The friend alerted authorities. The chief prosecutor in Frankfurt secures a search warrant for Settelmeyer's home. Zetelmeyer was always considered to be um, a potential link to Mengele in South America. The hunt for the Nazi doctor moves into high gear. May 31st, 1985. German special agents raid the home of Mengele family fixer Hans Zetelmeyer. They knew that if they told the local Bavarian police there was bound to be an informer for the Mengele family who would then tip them off and you know make sure they hid everything. So they got a different police force from another part of the country to go and raid Sadelmeyer's property. The search was conducted by the, the Bundeskriminalamt, which is the German federal police. They do this search, he thinks he's safe. It's only by luck when they move this large sort of armoire or cabinet that they find something. Behind the furniture, Investigators unearth a secret stash of envelopes. There they found these letters that had been sent uh, from Mengele. They found everything, all the letters, all the addresses of his helpers. Long had been rumored the fact that uh, Settlemeyer's wife had had a crush on Joseph Mengele early on. And Mengele had letters to her directly as well as to Hans Settlemeyer. Among the cache of letters, investigators find one that includes a stunning revelation. With deep sorrow, I tell you of the death of our common friend. That led the Germans to believe that Mengele had died in Brazil in 1979. Settlemeyer is arrested. A search of his address book links Mengele to a residence in Sao Paulo. David Marwell, an investigator with the U.S. Justice Department, is part of the international force now hunting Mengele. The Germans, after the discovery of the documentation in the Zetelmeyer home, uh, went directly to uh, Sao Paulo. Brazilian police are brought on board. Romeo Tuma was the, uh, the captain who ran the Brazilian investigation for the federal police. He received the material from the Germans. Tuma quickly determines who lives at the Sao Paulo address, a German family called the Bosserts.
there, they're not quite so genteel about a search warrant. They really do come in with full force. Police question them about their suspected link to Mengele. And they refused to give anything up. They said, no, it's not Mengele, it's not true. They lied, they denied it. But Tuma soon finds a makeshift shrine to Mengele and a stash of his personal writing and photographs. The truth about one of the era's most enduring mysteries is finally revealed. And finally they gave it up. The family admit to sheltering Mengele during the last four years of his life. But then they said where he was dead and then where they had buried him. Mengele is buried just outside on the outskirts of a, uh, a common cemetery where paupers are generally buried. And they dug up a six-year-old corpse. News of Mengele's death attracts a media throng to the gravesite. And there was Mengele's skull for everybody to see. And it was kind of held up for the cameras in a rather grisly way and snap, snap, snap. But questions linger. There were many who believed that he would, could have staged a death, and he had the requisite medical knowledge and clearly the motive to stage a death. Because he had this diabolical reputation, because he had this image that he was this cunning scientist beyond, you know, any form of natural justice, he was, you know, this was all just some cunning thing. Even though Mengele's bones had been dug up, a lot of people thought that Mengele was still alive. An international task force from Germany, Brazil, Israel, and America believe they have found Joseph Mengele. Forensic scientists must now prove the exhumed corpse really is the Nazi doctor. We put together a top flight team of pathologists and of radiologists and dental experts. The Israelis sent down the chief pathologist of the Israeli Defense Force. The forensic experts set out to uh, compare what they knew about the living Mangala with what evidence could be derived from the skeletonized remains. So they had compared the skull to a picture of, of Mengele's face and they blended the two together. So it's, it's very eerie, but very compelling as a piece of evidence. We spent a great deal of time examining the bones that were discovered in this grave, and I am absolutely confident that the bones were Joseph Mengele's. But for undeniable proof, they would have to wait for the advent of a new forensic technology. There was a lot of room for the doubters to think that actually maybe he's, you know, still still around. Maybe this is all a fix. And it did take uh, really um, genetic testing in the early 90s to fundamentally prove to people that the, these were indeed Mengele's bones. They were ground and they were able to, to collect a tiny amount of, of DNA, enough to analyze it. The results are definitive. The bones are Joseph Mengele's. There he was, he was dead. The hunt for Joseph Mengele is over. The full details of how he died are revealed. Mengele's death was, in many ways, pitiful, and it was kind of the pitiful death that he deserved. With some friends, he was taken down to Bertioga Beach, which is about 20 or 30 miles just south of Sao Paulo, and uh, hey, sat in their sort of beach house they had, a little beach house. They persuaded him, look, you know, uh, why don't you go out for a swim? <laughs> Mengele always refused to go outside because, oh, I don't like the sun, and uh, maybe, and also he thought he might be spotted by someone. And he eventually said, okay, I will.
current is very, very strong as it is around there. On this hot summer day, Mengele swam out from the beach uh, a little bit further than he should have. And uh, it became quite apparent within a few minutes that he was in trouble. tried to resuscitate him. He had had a stroke. And if you have a stroke while you're swimming, the combination isn't great. And he dies in the water, either th from drowning or from the stroke itself. The interesting thing is that after his death, they had wanted, they talked about whether they should cremate him. They couldn't get anyone in the Mengele family to sign off on it. They wanted to cremate the remains. If they had done that, nobody today, including me, would think he's dead. The world's most notorious Nazi fugitive would never answer for his crimes. They would have loved to have had that trial for the historical record for Mengele. The victims deserved that, and that was frustrating for the Mossad. Israel sometimes apologize why uh, he didn't succeed to bring Mengele into trial. When I write my memory, I'm not going to apologize. There's no punishment for a fellow like Mengele. Even if he's caught and he's executed, the second at the end of the hangman's noose isn't justice for what he did. But th there is some justice in that after the Eichmann kidnapping. He is really a bitter, depressed, unhappy man. That gives me great satisfaction. I think in many ways, I feel sorry for people like Joseph Mengele because they had a twisted idea of what is right and what is wrong. I don't believe that the perpetrators escaped scot-free. I think they lived a miserable life filled with guilt. And if you're looking for shards of justice and all this, um, he didn't lead the life that many fantasized he did. And this was not a comfortable life. Mengele died an old man. And they held with him. 